Okay, everybody, welcome back. We're still at AWP 2018. It's been an amazing couple of days. I'm Rich Folley, this is PBS Books. Our coverage today is brought to you by the PBS The Great American Read series. And it's really cool right now to be sitting with Chris Abani, Hi. who is the author of several works of poetry and a novel called The Secret History of Las Vegas. And your most recent book of poetry is Sanctificum. That's right. Right. That's it's so right. cool to have you. You do so many different things. I try to. That's how I stay out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for having me. It's really kind of you to accommodate me. Uh, well, let's start with your background. You're a Nigerian? Nigerian, yes. And yeah. you've been here how long? Oh, I've lived in the U.S. for 17 years, but my mom was English, so grew up in Nigeria until I was about 26, then moved to London, and then I moved here 17 years ago. So I feel like I'm everything. Yes, you're, you're a mix now. <laughs> yes. And, and, and we've, we've taken over you now. You've been here I like enough. that. I like that. There's something, um, you know, like Nigerian culture is very protocol heavy. British culture is very protocol heavy. And American culture is loose on protocol. So it's like a very comfortable place to be. But the, your, your Nigerian upbringing though, still, still weighs on you. It's still part of your life, obviously. It's still a part of who you are. Right. And in fact, when you were very young, you were in the middle of some really challenging times in Nigeria. Yeah. Is that something that you remember or was a part of your life still? There um, was a war. No, I mean, the war, because I was so young when it happened, I think is very deeply seared into me. Um, and then, you know, my brothers and my mother, we all, you know, so the whole family survives the war. And so you can't escape it, it becomes part of history. And even the things I don't remember viscerally, you grow up with the stories. And so it's almost like they're your memories, if that makes sense. So there is a kind of, um, and particularly being Igbo as well within Nigeria, we were, we were the rebels, so to speak. So there, there is always this outsider status that that kind of brings to a person and then being biracial and all of, so it's, it's sort of you're in a culture, but you're simultaneously looking at it from the outside. It's a, it's a beautiful place to be. Many so how has, that, how has that affected all of your writing? Well, I think several things. You know, I think that um, you, you, you meet, you'll meet sort of um, young, I teach young Jewish students in their 20s uh, or Armenian students who are also who carry the Holocaust or the genocide in them. You know, there's a way, it's almost like family DNA. Yeah. Uh, so there's a certain melancholy. And it, melancholy is a beautiful thing. It's not sorrow, it's not sadness, it's not grief. It's sort of like a, a bittersweet yearning. So there's that melancholy that affects all my work where we're simultaneously dealing with things that are really searingly difficult, but at the same time, there's a kind of joy and a, a delight in it, you know? Almost like, you know, it's like a Charlie Parker solo or, you know, like picking a scab and delighting in that. So there's that part of it. And then I just think that, that being when you were more, kind of in a, a way a multiple personality, very Igbo, spoke Igbo, lived an Igbo life, but my mother was English. And so there was all of the sort of tea at four rituals right next to all the other stuff. So you're always, I'm always code switching. And so then if you look at my books, there is that kind of um, shift all the time. Narratives, narratives are inside and outside. But I think the most important thing is that there is no distance between the reader and my protagonists. I think that's the one thing that seems to have collapsed in the process, which is beautiful and terrifying. Why? Why is that? Well, I think that part of it is when you are kind of caught in a dialectic where you're in and out, so you're deeply of something, but at the same time, there's a part of you that can look at it, not objectively, but from another position, you're kind of caught in this dialectic. And so the only way to resolve that is to sort of um, hand it over to a reader to experience it viscerally. And so then the characters become so real and I, I disappear from the work. And so when the readers read it, they assume almost the body of the narrator and then they go through the experience. And so my books can be difficult to read in that way, not even really because of the subject matter, but because I think the only way I know how to write is to bring the experience onto someone else's body in a way, yeah. That's really interesting that there's actually another dimension that you, that you assume as you're writing it is going yeah. to happen. Yeah. And you, know, you can't always predict exactly where that's going to go because you don't know right. all these people. A lot of times though, people will assume that the narrator is, is you. Uh, and in other cases, in your, what you're saying is that the narrator is actually often the reader. It's almost always, the, well, at least the emotional response is always the reader's. Um, people always assume, you know, that's the thing about being a fiction writer in America. You can put novel on it or whatever you like. There's something about American reading culture and the belief that this is thinly masked autobiography yeah. you can't get away from. And I suppose to a certain extent, even if you write, whatever you write, 
even if the context or the situation is not autobiographical, your intellectual, your emotional, spiritual matrix is what's going into the characters. So there is a part of you always being negotiated. But what's interesting is that what often happens is that the writer, the reader, confronts themselves somehow in the work. Part of it is that I tend to suspend the moral order of the universes that I write about. So you have to decide, and that's an uncomfortable. I mean, people compare me to, um, uh, but some of my works are like No Country for Old Men, right? Because it's not that there's a, there's a violence to it, but the violence is not spectacle, right? So, so the way Cormac McCarthy drops you into the experience is sort of, and I think that it's, it's that straddling idea, yeah. yeah. You talked about teaching earlier, and, yeah. and you teach a lot of different types of students. What do you, for you, when you're saying, I don't know how long you've been teaching, but there's definitely sort of a, an embrace of the poetic form. Yeah. It seems like it's really growing right now. I'm curious yeah. as to how your students are attracted to poetry and poems, and then just sort of narrative forms in general right now. Right. Um, you know, I think part of it has to do, um, with, you know, people were a little bit more reluctant when I was younger to want to be writers. It just seemed like something out of reach. But you know, I have a generation of people who are super confident about everything and feel like... How being, did that happen? Where I don't know. I, I blame the parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's a good thing in many ways. Because like, I watch kids hold conversations at 15 or 14 yeah. that I would never have been able to. And I was one of those teenagers who like, put my head down and mumbled a lot. And I have these kids who like, engage me in conversation. And I'm like, wow, this is profound. Um, I don't know what it is. It could be an expansive consciousness, but they come, they come interested enough to write in more with questions and with answers. And I would have thought of it the other way around. I don't know whether it's because the, the sort of the virtual nature of a lot of their experience through internet, the media, um, creates questions and possibilities because they don't have to, they don't think of themselves as singular identities anymore. You know, you can have a, a kid from the Midwest who has more in common with a kid in Japan who they've never met uh, than they have with like the kid down the street. And before, we had to just deal with the kid down the street. So I think it opens up beautiful things in them, and they're they're wonderful to teach. And I learn a lot from them all. The, not about form or anything, but about simple things like joy. Like they remind you how, you know, how wonderful it is to stumble upon an experience, or when they write a poem that they think is really bad and you show them how half of it is actually quite amazing. And what, you know, the look on their faces, it's sort of, you know, I don't know, it's beautiful. It's a yeah, beautiful it's, thing. It's probably unfair for me to sort of paint such a broad brush, but I have four kids that are uh, doing things and recognizing things, and I see their friends doing the same thing. They just seem more aware and more cognizant of the world around them. They seem that they're growing up they in a world that's less uh, narrow. Than yes, mine less narrow, but also sometimes conversely more narrow, because like, the internet becomes so big or the the range of expression becomes so big that they tend to sometimes go down very small rabbit holes and that becomes their life. But I, I suppose that was, there were kids like that when I was growing up Well, too, where did it come from for you? I mean, where did your writing sort of background and life and interest come from? Where did it spur? So I was, I was one of those weird, precocious nerds. So I wasn't very good with people, um, I was very shy. Um, and so that probably meant a lot of interior work. But I think I never thought about being a writer, but I was a kid who, I have elder brothers and there's a gap in years, so they couldn't quite play with me. And then, so that all the things I want, boys want to play at, I had to play with the imaginary. So I'd always be talking to imaginary people. So that's probably that whole kind of idea of enactment starts early. But reading lots of comic books is really the thing. But reading, my, my parents had amazing libraries, but the things were just shoved around on shelves. So you read Dostoevsky today, you read Baldwin tomorrow, Achebe the day after, The Silver Surfer. So all of it sort of, my imagination was not a hierarchical place. So when you were young, that was coming from your parents? That was coming from my parents. And my mother actually uh, started typing stories for me when I was like 10 and submitting them to things. Um, and so I guess for me, it, it wasn't so much here is the moment, although there was a moment around 10, I think when I realized I had an epiphany about wanting to do it, but I didn't really know what that meant. Um, so sometimes it's just having a parent who thinks, this is what you're really good at. And then instead of trying to make you a football job, they let you be the nerd. So, there you go. Yeah. You, you write a lot of different forms, though. Yes, I do. Um, whether it's essays, poetry, fiction, Screen novels. Screenplays, even. Screenplays. Yeah. I mean, 
you you don't confine yourself to one right. one type of writing. Right. Um, that's always been something where you just have never been in a, like wanted to limit yourself. No, I so, no, I have never been, and I think part of it again has to do with how you grow up, right? So, I think writing is a continuum. It's, it's like sexuality and gender. Um, so, if I, I grew up in post Civil War seventies Nigeria, there's all of the American movie influences. There's a lot of Bollywood movie influences. There's already the emergent Nollywood stuff, um, books, comic books, music. So it's a very cosmopolitan place. And so, and if you come, if you're born of middle class parents, one is white English woman, one is a Nigerian, uh, they met at Oxford. So you, you never think of yourself as one thing. You're kind of always code switching and moving through. So I think I brought the same idea to, to, to writing that it was like, you, if you knew the rules of the different genres in your practice, you could just go back and forth. So it's just, I think it's just it how I It seems like up. a gift to not think of yourself as one thing. And I think yeah. that there's a, a lot of us that don't, that this wasn't the way we were brought up. And yet you, yes. you bring to the table this ability to sort of see yourself in a lot of, through a lot of different lenses. Right. Yeah, I think, I think if part of it again had to do with a moment in time because I think by the 80s, a lot of that cosmopolitan, you know, I had Indian, because of the Civil War, people, we had to import teachers because teachers, so I had Indian teachers, Malay, you know, so like my whole formation was around different race, different culture, different food, different artistic influences. Um, and also I think that, you know, part of the difficulty with being American, there are lots of real difficulties with being American that people never almost seem, like Americans never get a break in that way. But it's sort of the expectation that you are who, you are what you do. So it's always confusing because I'm, I'm always Chris. I write, but I'm not a writer. I don't, my identity is not formed around that. It's one of the things I do, I teach. It's one of the things I do. But Chris remains essentially this kid that's roving around forms and has been lucky to find an audience, to find publishers, to find readers who kind of like what I do. Um, so for me, it's always a heart of gratitude. It's always, I'm so grateful all the time. And there's a joy to it all. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things I teach at Northwestern now, which is a very sort of Ivy League school, and kids are under a tremendous amount of pressure to, you know, for, as freshmen to already decide which merchant bank they're going to go work in. And so I see myself a little bit as that subversive professor who's sort of like, yeah, but have you thought about traveling through Mexico for you? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure the parents don't like me. Yeah. <laughs> but at least with the, I, I can allow the kids to have that it's okay to even imagine something, yet you're not betraying your place in the class system. And so I think it's, it's a beautiful exchange in that way. Well, it is indeed. And uh, I, love, I love your words. I love all the things that you do. I hope that we continue to see you in all these different places. Thank you. Including, by the way, on, for anybody interested in your TED Talk on YouTube, yes, they can you. see your, yes. your, your multimedia, your yes. multi-platform. Multi-platform. That's right. And now this, I think, is going to live on the internet. That's right. Forever. We'll yes. share it with, we'll share yes. it with many. Thank you. All right, Chris Abani, thanks Thank so, much so much for being brother. with us today on PBS Books.